All right, folks, we are back for another edition of Battle of the Ballads. I'm here with Greg and Joe, and it'd be wrong to start without paying some respects to Earl Simmons, obviously. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the, the lyrics, why must Earl, Swimmins, Earl Simmons swim in dirt was always in my head, like, for years, just as one of his lyrics, and now it's like, wow, shit, you know, it's real, so it's important to pay some respects to him, and I'm sure he'll show up at least on some short lists um, as we move forward. Yeah, I just, as far as DMX and Earl Simmons are, if you want to hear just a great tribute, and this was released before he passed, I've mentioned it in my newsletter, but Justin Charity and Micah Peters, I know they both used to formally write at The Ringer. I think they're writing for different places, but they do sound only. It's a Spotify exclusive podcast, and they did an episode on DMX they are our age, Dan. Well, Justin's our age. I think Mike is a little bit younger, so he's probably Joe's age. And they talk about the significance of DMX. And we can talk about it all day, like how important DMX was. But ultimately, these guys, these African-American individuals from the city, like they're going to have a better feeling for who he was, one of the things they talked about that was Earl lived the the life. He was Earl, he was DMX, and he was X. Those were three different individuals in his mind. That's how he coped with life. And they just talked about how he changed popular music and he doesn't get the credit for that because he, he narrowly edges out Eminem for coming out with that alter ego stuff and that pop music with insane lyrics because before that, like NWA, burst into the scene mm -hmm. with gangster rap and it was prevalent in the 90s but it wasn't just radio pop hits until dmx now bad boy entertainment kind of opened that door and like was able to slide in there um tupac and biggie they helped it but like x crashed the scene i i mentioned in the newsletter party up in here was played in high school gyms in the like, warp tour yeah yeah like <laughs> lyrically in junior high i should have not been dancing to any dmx but that was just the music swiss beats very much of the time but he had a lot to do with that too but there's a reason we listen to x still but we don't listen to everyone that did a swiss beat track there was yeah, something you know, about x's voice with those beats somehow that then there was x album was one of the roughest albums and was a pop sensation at the same time i mean <laughs> it, it's an anomaly in my book it, it just really is it's not my favorite of his it's just obviously the most popular one you know i'm um flesh in my flesh is my favorite but um it, somehow that album became a banger in every honda civic rowing around a high school parking lot <laughs> but i just uh yeah I gotta pay some respect to the guy you know i know it's everybody's got their skeletons man but um it was interesting on his albums, you know, he'd have his prayers, he'd have his skits and he'd have his songs. And those were the three versions of him, like you talked about. And it's just that composition alone um, was pretty genius. So yeah, I paid some respects to Earl Simmons. You know, he's not in our eighties takes, but I'm sure we'll see him late nineties, early two thousands. Um, at least not everyone mention. And I'm going to tell you guys, I'm a little nervous tonight. I think I'm going to get Rick rolled as we close out the eighties. Uh, he threw a stunner at me last time. So I am genuinely curious to see where we're going to go with this. If folks haven't been keeping track, this is the night where not only do we do 1988, 1989, this is also the night where we decide who survives the 80s to move on to the 90s um, and battle those, those songs. So Joe, our loose cannon, throw me the second Rick Astley last time. I was um, more than surprised when Gregory also picked <laughs> Rick Astley last week. Uh, but truthfully, this, this week's a lot more straightforward for 88 and 89. Uh, we're starting to get into music that means a little bit more to me, like from a sentimental perspective. I so I felt like these two years were a little bit simpler um, although there are, were a lot of songs as I was making lists, I decided from this point on my short list will have to be only 10 because as I was writing songs, I was like, 
man, I have a lot. And even in 88, I had like two different Paula Abdul. And I was like, well, I'm going to have to cut it down. I, I really just want to keep it to 10 every year. From this point on, it'll be nine honorable mentions and then my my pick for the year. Um, That's so, what I did. That's what I found myself having to do. Yeah, it was, it was too hard to just like put all the music I liked. So I had to keep it uh, to 10. So that does mean there are going to be some things that just don't show up because they're like the 11th, my 11th favorite song for the year. But anyway... Uh, for this year, uh, my honorable mentions, One by Metallica, uh, Kokomo by the Beach Boys, uh, The Promise by When in Rome, which just narrowly <laughs> missed the number one spot, honestly. That's a great track. Uh, the Wind Beneath My Wings, Bette Midler, You've Got It, The Right Stuff, New Kids on the Block, uh, I'm Gonna Be, The Proclaimers, Fast Car, Chasey. Tracy Chapman, Straight Up is the Paula Abdul I decided to keep for this year. Uh, love that song, one of my favorites. A Little Respect by Erasure, or Erasure, however it's pronounced, um, mostly because of that episode of Scrubs. Scrubs. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Um, Weedist later did a cover of it as well. That's fantastic. Um, but my number one for 1988, My Heart Can't Tell You No, Rod Stewart. Hmm. Uh, this is a song that means a lot to me uh, for very sentimental reasons. I'm the youngest of us kids. And so there was a stretch of time where everyone else was in school and I was home with my mother while she was getting ready for work and stuff like that. And I can remember distinctly dancing around the living room to a number of songs but this one is the one that has always stuck out most prominently to me because we made up a dance to the solo in the middle of it. And so when this song comes back, it's just, or whenever I hear it, it's just a flood of memories. It's one of my favorite all time songs uh, for a lot of reasons. I like that the critical comments for it, like, or like it was obviously commercial. It was him like trying to make a hit, don't care at all. I love it so much. You know, that, that story there kind of rocks the stadium in my heart. That's that's a beautiful thing, man. I love all these stories of you dancing. It just makes me smile inside. There's no lie in that him and my mother wore that cassette out. It was the Rod Stewart's Greatest Hits cassette. <laughs> that's a great album. And it's a banger. So yeah. uh, all four of us kids know that cassette front to back. So I kind of knew that was going to be his pick. If you don't mind, Dan, I'll just roll into mine. Yeah. So I don't have a, a 10 rule. I think I only have 13, quote unquote. Uh, and I'm not going to do an artist. But there's a, actually a lot Joe listed that I didn't have listed because I was trying to keep it roughly between 10 and 15. Some years I'll hit it, some years I won't. So for me, Nightmare on My Street and Parents Just Don't Understand. Those are my two <laughs> favorite Fresh Prince and DZ, DJ Jazzy Jeff tracks like for me nightmare on my street is the best it's always a halloween classic then i also have rod stewart i do have my heart can't tell you no uh, but unfortunately i typed no as in n-o-y i just want to call myself out on my typo here <laughs> but for me forever young was out that same year and i i like that track better mm -hmm. uh don't believe the hype public enemy yes microphone fiend Eric B and Rakim, which is just a great song. I think it now probably has a better following than it did any time in the 90s. It was the track I thought might be your curveball, Dan, because it is played on the weekends at Targets, and it's awesome. Uh, straight out of Compton, NWA, and I have the asterisks on this because you could pick any track off that album. Yeah. Express Yourself being the other standout. Jane Says, Jane's Addiction. I'm not a huge Jane Addiction fan, but Jane Says gets me all the time. That song on acoustic just is absolutely incredible. Yeah, Perry Farrell's voice is fantastic, and I think he just lets it fly on that song. Orange Crush, R.E.M. Might be my favorite Orange Crush song just because of how catchy and annoying it is. Like, you hear Orange Crush, it's stuck in your head for days, and you only know the lyric or the chorus. Well, that's why when you were talking about REM in our last episode, I was thinking in my head, I'm like, that's really the only REM song I'm a fan of. And so it's it's funny you mentioned that now. 
Oh, I love Man on the Moon, but I also loved that movie. And Andy Kaufman. Yeah. So, and then Losing My Religion is another REM one that gets me too. But Cold of Personality made my short list. This isn't a song I ever listened to growing up or even in my late teens, but it is the entrance music to former pro wrestler CM Punk. And as a pro wrestling fan, there's just something about Vince McMahon spending money to have an actually actual licensed artist song that just adds significance to a wrestler. So for any WWE fan who loved CM Punk in that run, like cult of personality hits and it hits hard for them. Fast Car, Tracy Chapman, it blew my mind that it was released in 88 just because it was so prevalent basically my entire life. I mean, the video got heavy play in 95 on MTV. It was all over the place on MTV in 1995. It's just insane. Well, and if you follow my social media, I think I play it at least once a week. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, and then I had a tough time with this last one because it could be any song off this album, but I went, please don't girl new kids on the block as my song of 88. Much like Joe, this has like childhood significance to me. We wore out the VHS of one of the concerts. I had the hat, I had the bed sheets, I had the marbles. Uh, my dear lifelong friend, Vanessa LaFleur and I used to have a rotating group of people dancing on her picnic table behind her apartment two new kids on the block just that album was everything to me and please don't go girl is the one i would always quote unquote solo when we we're playing our new kids on the block band so if i were to listen to that album now it'd probably be like hanging tough but it's please don't go girl for that sentimental purposes hanging tough is one of my favorite drinking songs and i'm not ashamed to say that uh so yeah. You both really threw me for a loop here, and I love that. Um, I, mean, I apologize for interrupting you as you talked. I just get so excited about this shit. Um, God, there's so much good music really at I mean, we've already talked about Tracy Chapman's Fast Car, Erasure's Respect, which is actually one of my all-time favorite songs, even before the Scrub soundtrack. Growing up, um, my mom listened to a lot of Erasure, and that's I just remember you know the synth pop stuff, and big fan of it. Um, so much Fresh Prince, Slick Rick, which Greg covered. I'm um, not going to go over my whole list because you guys already said it, but um, it's a little known song, but it's very relevant now. It was very relevant then, and I think more people need to hear it. It's actually Open Letter to a Landlord by Living Color. Um, one of my favorite tracks of all time. Uh, it's just, it really struck me, you know, growing up without money, without anything, with looking at um, things from a perspective of like, why are so many people suffering kind of thing, which has been kind of my lifelong mission to end that, which I know I'll fail, but I'm going to die trying. Um, this song, it just hits me in so many ways. It's a social commentary that the world wasn't ready for and still isn't ready for. I actually listen to this track at least once a day. Um, on my car ride either to or from work, depending on Zoe's with me. She likes to headbang sometimes. Um, Living Color is one of the most underrated bands, in my opinion. But this song has so much cultural, social relevance and just it slaps as a track and the second i introduce people to it they're like holy shit how did i never hear this in my lifetime um that is my favorite song to make it out of the 80s and actually we're not out of the 80s out of 88 um no no prince is my guy but um <laughs> that came off their vivid album and that entire album start to finish is probably my top five albums of all time and whenever i tell people they're like what, what even is that <laughs> and so then i have an excuse to put it on so for the two of you if you are familiar with the al album i encourage you to put it on I'm honestly, right. it's on my short list. I've never listened to that album because I only know Cold of Personality from wrestling. So, Oh, yeah. I've never heard that song. I have no idea what it is. So um, I'm excited to listen to it after this. I hear it and I just, I feel all the emotions. So that is my track um, for AD. And it's actually, I think, in my top three of the 80s that we did, um, which is really tough because I, I got LL in there too. But um Yes, open letter to a landlord from Living Color. That's so funny. that, yeah, I don't even know that song. That's a great choice. I'm definitely excited to listen to it. So, it's uh, it, it's it shows their it's probably the song that shows their range the most of all the songs they did too. Um, it's it's pretty intense. It's awesome. Um, but with that said, we got to get into 1989 here and. 
Vardy had NKTOB, which I thought their tracks were 89, so that's on me because I thought that's when that came out. Um, so some of them were released as singles in uh, there 89 uh, because I believe the album was actually released in 88, but Hanging Tough actually shows up in most things as 89 that's because thought, it was okay. released as a single in 89 because uh, okay. that actually was my final cut off my short list for 89 gotcha. because I have them on my short list for 88. So they were that was that was kind of how I did some of my chopping block if they showed up on the short list before. So as we venture in 89, Joe, what kind of surprises you got for us? Uh, probably none at all. <laughs> um, so I this one was harder for me. I think my list was originally around 20 to 22. And so chopping over half of it to get down to my arbitrarily self-set 10 <laughs> was difficult. Um, Hate Jealousy, uh, just barely actually off the top. I love that song. Gin Blossoms is great. That album's amazing. Um, Dr. Feelgood, Motley Crue. Uh, Bust a Move. Uh, Blame It on the Rain. I love me some uh, Millie Vanilli. Uh, I, we bump that one all the time. Uh, How Am I Supposed to Live Without You, Michael Bolton. Uh, that one just gives you the feels. Bolton slaps uh, really hard, honestly. Yes, agreed wholeheartedly. Uh, share If I Could Turn Back Time, because I love belting that one out. The Ramones, Pet Cemetery. It's so good. That made the movie for me, because the movie's not good at all, but that song is amazing. Uh, she Drives Me Crazy, Fine Young Cannibals. Uh, that one just gets in your head and never leaves. Uh, is that off the this, album Raw Meat? Isn't that what that album was called? I don't know the name of the album, honestly. It I just know raw meat. A, a handful of the I, tracks. I, I do believe you're right about it being Raw Meat, yeah. which is a great name for yeah, that band that, as well. That, that's, right? why, that's why I triggered that thought. Uh, and then my last honorable mention is Bismarck E, Just a Friend. Uh, another close cut, but... The winner is Tom Petty, Free Fallen. Um, for me, again, we grew up on a lot of Tom Petty. That was one of the things that was always on everywhere we went when we were in the car. And that song specifically, I think, has had some of the longest impact. Bands have been covering it since. Uh, I mean, like John Mayer's John cover Mayer of it is, is amazing. Uh, there's one off the Punk Goes Pop series of albums as well that just absolutely slaps. And so for me, it's the most recognizable, again, for me. And I think it's had a lot more, like, I think it's cultural relevance is still like propagating today. And so it's Tom Petty, Free Fallen. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to see him live like somebody in this chat. You know, I'd always wanted to see the Traveling Wilburys. So that was like on my bucket list. Um, and I will forever be sad that I didn't get to see that. Um, I didn't get to see Petty Live twice, which was really my goal. <laughs> oh, you shot. Um, but so honestly, the, uh, the week he passed away, I was headed to a music festival, uh, Cal Jam, that the Foo Fighters hosted. And of course, Dave Grohl traveled with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers after Nirvana and the entire show because it was hosted by Dave Grohl and Foo Fighters was all just his friends and so just about every one of the acts did some sort of tribute um I think um why am I blanking on their name uh they did the uh wow I feel like an idiot Queens of the Stone Age obviously did a, a tribute to them but um Back Against the Wall. Who sings that song? Why am I blanking on that band? Cage the Elephant. Oh, okay. They started their set with uh, Last Dance with Mary Jane, and it was oh, so nice. good. They really nailed it. And when they play, when uh, Foo Fighters played Free Fall or uh, My Hero, they had uh, a large hologram of Tom Petty, and there was a really nice shout out about like his contributions to music and how much he's meant to Dave Grohl and Foo Fighters. It was really, really beautiful, but nice. Tom Petty all the way. Greg, what do you got, my friend? Uh, keeping Petty from being my song of the year, that was the year he released his first solo album, even though essentially 
the Heartbreakers still backed him. Yeah. But it was the first one listed just as Tom Petty. And I mean, Free Fallen, Facing the Crowd, which Spoon recently released one of their covers on Spotify. Spoon might be top three in bands for me. And that cover, and they also did Running Down a Dream off that album, which is on my short list. Anything on this album, Fever Dream is there. But those two Spoon covers are fantastic. As Joe mentioned, everyone has covered Spoon. I know Amazon just uh, not too long ago did a celebration of him. Adam Sandler just released him doing a Tom Petty cover, which was really great that he jammed to with his daughter. So yeah. Petty means everything. He's just a good example of evolving too. Not only as like an artist, because he kept up changing slightly his style, but early in his career, having the Federate flag, like prominent part of his stage premise. And then to later in the career, chastising fans that they needed to educate themselves like he did and that he'd moved past that it's just a lesson that we can always change we don't need to be hard set in our ways mm-hmm. so, anything off that album for petty is on my short list but i've always seen him as a bob dylan with personality <laughs> and a better voice <laughs> you're not wrong in similar careers in the fact that they've just got these stellar careers but then when mm-hmm. you go and look at the stuff they wrote for other artists I'm like, oh, wait, you wrote tracks for the Cars and Genesis, yeah. Tom Petty? Yeah. Like, how you're, I know after his passing, The Ringer did a great introspective of all the songs that he'd written for others that were fantastic. That never even made his catalog. It's, it's insane. Yeah. Uh, but no, 89, what a great year. You had Tone Loke, so you have Wild Thing and Funky Cold Medina. <laughs> mm-hmm. You have De La Souls, Me, Myself, and I. You have Pictures of You and Love Song by The Cure, which are probably my two favorite Cure songs. You have Bat Dance. I mean, the entire first Dance. Batman soundtrack's great, but Bat Dance. Wicked Games by Chris Isaac, which is a top 10, maybe 15 track for me. I only left that off because I knew you would bring it up. That was how, that was the reason that one got the axe. I actually left that off my short list because I thought after the Wham um, bombshell that Greg was going to go with that song. <laughs> It, it is another one that I love to play at the bar, but I think I think that that video was perfect. Mm-hmm. I love Chris Isaac as a person. It's not surprising he had a talk show for a while because he was he was one of those first artists that could be the guest and the performer. I remember yeah. an LL quote where he said he wanted to be Chris Isaac. He wanted to be the opening guest and then the performer. And Dave Grohl has followed that model. He can he can be a guest either as himself or with Taylor Hawkins yeah, and then be performing. And that's just a great thing. I don't need my musician to be a talk show guest, but it's fun when they can be. Hey Ladies by the Beastie Boys. Rhythm Nation, Janet Jackson. Joe already mentioned Blame It on the Rain. What a great track. Head Like a Hole, Nine Inch Nails. Might be the only Nine Inch Nail song I'll ride for. Then for anyone who didn't grow up on the Canadian border, there is a legendary Canadian band, Tragically Hip. And this is the year... 38 years old in New Orleans is sinking came out and yeah. it's hard to believe they came out that long ago because their mainstays on all Canadian radio stations and they always should be the one I had a hard well, time I mean, rest in peace to Gordy too I mean what a what a voice what a man in that community it's uh to explain yeah. to people who aren't familiar how important Gordy is to the Canadian experience the country shut down for two nights as his I, I wanted to say retirement, but it's not retirement. They were literally going to be his last shows ever, and everyone knew it. So the country shut down to watch t- televised countries. Uh, thankfully, is a band I was able to see. So two I think hours. I to a head by a century, like just on a loop for I don't even know how fucking long. <laughs> yeah, growing up on the Canadian border, and there's another band I know the three of us love that we'll get to in a couple of years here. That uh, is another Canadian like legend for us. Uh, the song I really had a hard time, and I put it on the short list, but About a Girl from Nirvana, this was when it was released on the demo, yep. but this is before Nirvana was Nirvana, and so for me, I couldn't make it the song of the year, even though I did it with Rick Roll, even though the song was a couple years, because it wasn't until The Unplugged that About a Girl became About a Girl. Yes. yes. And, I mean, so for me, since its relevance didn't come for so long, and I think About a Girl is now the track people just kind of associate with the end of Kurt's life, right or wrong, um, which this album we will talk about when we get to the year, but... By 94? 
94. Yeah, 94. And since it was this performance was recorded be, right before his death, like to me, even though it was released in 89, about a girl is 94. But Joe mentioned it, just a friend, Bismarcky. It is the song of the year at 89. <laughs> if you play it right now, nine-year-olds have heard this song and love this song. It's just, it's that kind of song, the glee in Biz's voice. What a terrible rapper who made one of the greatest rap songs of all time. Like, <laughs> good he's, for Biz. He's a pretty funny human. I, I give him credit for that. And, you know, he brought, he, he made Mario relevant when Mario tried his song. So, we'll yeah. Him. I mean, without Biz Marquee, we don't get Afro Man. Yeah. No, we don't. <laughs> and then what does my junior high football and lacrosse team do? We on don't the get Colt 45 and <laughs> because I got high. <laughs> yes. You threw me for a loop again, man. I, I uh, got to regain some composure on here. Uh, nice. Can I jump? Can I jump back real quick for one moment? You mentioned uh, important Canadian bands, and I had ended up leaving Tom Cochran and Red Rider off my '88 list because I thought you were going to mention them as well, and that's how they got the axe. But I do want to throw out there that to me, uh, they fall into a similar category as the Hip, in that Tom Cochran and Red Rider were so important to a lot of. Canadian music and again growing up on the Canadian border we got a lot of a lot of at least the a few of the songs big league I think was the big one in 88 that I, I ended up axing but no I'm not I didn't grow up where you guys did um, and I'm glad because it's really fucking cold there but I am a huge fan of Canadian music and many of them are on my list of bands and so I think we may need to do a separate YouTube thing for ranking these Canadian bands because I'm I gonna, was I was thinking the same thing because that's half my playlist, to be honest. <laughs> the last trivia I did before the world shut down, there was a or a Juno Awards category, and it was insane because it was all like the pop artists. So Bieber was a question. So it was current pop artists, and I'm just listing to my team thirty years of Juno Award winning. <laughs> artists and so now one of those guys who didn't know i'd grown up on the border and that i had so many favorite canadian bands now just associates me with canadian music I mean, he hears an artist from canada he assumes i must love them yeah yeah the hip i'm mother, i'm mother earth tea party olp like it's yes <laughs> matthew good it's all that's my playlist yeah. like for life but it threw me for a loop there and I'm going to repeat some songs that were said. You know, it's it was a tough call for me this year. Um, we had Public Enemies, Fight Power. We had Head Like a Hole, Nine Chanels, which, like Greg, that's one of my few besides Hurt that I'd go with for them. I remember Hurt's you. a Johnny Cash song, and even Reznor has admitted it, so. But they still did it, and I actually they liked did. it. Yeah. And though I like. Um, I like watching it live is a different experience. I actually like it better than the Johnny Cash version. Uh, th when they do it live, it's an absolute experience. It is and I'm going to say the moment I was at in my life when I first heard that on Further Down the Spiral, um, that was very transcending for me in that moment um, in my emo Jenko wearing self. So I needed <laughs> that when it came out. <laughs> um, uh, I Remember You by Skid Row. It's just, uh, that's a huge track for me, but also um, my other friend, Greg, and I used to watch October Road together and they had I Remember You uh, on an episode there and that just kind of became like our jam. Um, so it's got some sentimental value to me. But then there was De La Soul's Me, Myself and I. And I had to go with De La Soul because that was the beginning of like my musical awakening for this genre of music. And it's one of those tracks that whenever I I'm like oh, music today sucks, I need some real hip hop. That's the one I go back to. Um, that's just um, for me, it just transcended all time. Um, it brought us creative and insightful hip hop without the message was there, but it was delivered in a different way than we were getting from NWA and Public Enemy and things like that. Like the, it was more about the art than it was the message. And it was about blending both um, kind of like what Tribe Called Quest gave us, things like that, you know, so it, it was interesting to me, but it just, it blended so many different genres um, for that track. And I honestly, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, people talk about it and they nod their heads, but I think it's one of those that's often slept on um but it's how true over the course of time you know you can't watch a hip-hop documentary without this track on there and so for me that's that's the song of the year for me um because of its relevance overall and because of how it kind of laid the laid the groundwork for a lot of artists that came out a lot of songs that we heard for the next 10 to 20 years after that so i have to i have to go with that track well i mean that whole movement that was three feet and rising right yeah 
Yeah, I mean, because you have Tribe coming out of that same, not only the same like style of hip hop, but even the same like location. And I mean, without Tribe and De La Soul and that whole movement, you don't get the roots. You don't get Buster yeah. Rhymes. I was going to say, we have Busta Busta out of that. The skinny little Busta. So, uh, and I remember, what was it? Was it 2003, 2004 when Shopping Bags came out? Around that time, not a great De La Soul effort, but still fun. And they'd put on their website that BT refused to play him because it wasn't relevant. Yep. And they just put B B T full on blast. They where they were the record was charting back when people were still buying CDs and that mattered. Where the radio play was at, and they just like, but we're not relevant. And I was like, damn, De La De La is out for it right now. And I was like, for a group that I don't ever associate with any like hip hop beef, it was just fun to see them go hard at B T. <laughs> Well, it's interesting too because they they came out as the the intellectuals of it. You know, everybody was heady with all this. You know, all the groups were, but they came out as we're not just gonna be smart in our lyrics. We're gonna be smart in our videos. We're not gonna, you know, we're gonna create our way to the top, basically. Um, as opposed to we're in the streets and you know, like fuck the police, all that stuff. They're like, we're gonna say share the same message, but we're gonna have some fun with it. We're gonna be creative. You know, we're we're a smart group of dudes. Here we are. And I think because of that, they were kind of slept on a lot. You know, like they were cool for MTV because they weren't edgy, they weren't too gritty, but they didn't get the airplay that the other ones did because they were wrapped up in controversies to report on MTV news. You know, it's, it, it, it was an interesting blend that they found themselves in. And even with just how impactful their music was, especially, you know, when they did blend with um, Tribe Called Quest and then Busta's group. And, you know, you had this whole blending of just great shit. They were somehow lost in the shuffle. And um, I remember watched some interviews with them a couple of years ago. They were so creative that they couldn't get out of their own way to release other pro- other stuff. It just, it, they were just such perfectionists about it, um, which is wild. So it's just gotta be my track. I, I didn't feel right not having that be my song coming out of that year. It's a, it's a great song choice. And the problem is they didn't have a Q-tip. So not only were they not releasing because of their own personalities, but they were just great dudes, but they didn't have that charismatic front man, which is something yep. people forget about a hip hop group is you still need. Now, sometimes Busta didn't stay in his group long at all. That first album was like, <laughs> oh no, Busta needs to go solo. Yeah. But Tribe stayed together for forever. And Q-Tip was that guy. Yep. He, had that, he had that sound to his voice. He had that personality that popped. And De La Soul was great, but didn't have that pop which i think when they hit in 2002 2001 with the track they did with red man and just i mean the video was great as the wizard of oz tribute but just having that charismatic red man who is just great like brought them back into it and i was so happy for those guys to have another hit that late in their career so good for them excellent choice unfortunately since rick roll exists not the track of the 80s. <laughs> yeah, gentlemen, we got to fly through the years now. So starting in 84, because we're just going to move year by year here. So starting in 84, we have Joe's Choice, Prince When Doves Cry, Greg, Wham, Carol's Whisper, which since talking about that song, I have now listened to every day since that first uh, episode we did. And then I had Prince Purple Rain. And I will fight to the death that Purple Rain is the best song of all time. But that's because it's my greatest song of all time. But gentlemen, what do you think moves out of 84 for us? If we're going to take my personal feelings out of it, it's Purple Rain. Uh, I disagree. I still think it's When Doves Cry. Well, I think for me personally, <clears throat> When Doves Cry is a better track. But there was a few years ago in Pittsburgh, I was at a hipster bar and they were doing MJ versus Prince. Jesus. And every time they played a Prince song, the entire bar started moving. MJ was only when Thriller and when the Jackson 5 stuff came on, which says everything about the two of them. Yeah. But there wasn't a bigger reaction than when Purple Rain hit. So never seen Prince live, but having been in a bar where I heard most of the big Prince hits play in the reaction. So at least a bunch of uh, mostly white hipsters in Pittsburgh, Purple Rain is, <laughs> Purple Rain is their jam. 
and that's what, my barometer. What about even that Super Bowl halftime show? That's arguably one of the greatest halftime shows of all time. Um, it is the greatest half set half and live show. performances, and just the purple rain right there. I mean, I uh, yeah, I don't know. I got to take it at least from '84. <laughs> I mean, I'm not voted, so that's fine. I mean, it's Prince or Prince, right? (laughs) We got two for 84. All right, now we move into 85. Joe had We Are the World. Greg and I both had LL, I Can't Live Without My Radio. What do we do, gents? I mean, I know you guys are together on that, so it probably goes through. I still think the bigger impact is We Are the World. Well, now we're we're actually in a dilemma here because we're not just picking that year. We're picking, does Prince move on past that or do we go with a new track? Okay, this is how we're doing it. That's cool. I wasn't I wasn't quite tracking this. Um, I mean, I'm I'm with I'm on Prince. I'm on the Prince train for this. Dan's gonna be on the Prince train still, I think. So <laughs> I, I, I guess I haven't been clear about it. I I don't think you guys are wrong, but I voted against my heart in 84 and I think for the right reason. So even though I know I've now outvoted, I'm still going to go with LL. Yeah, that's great. Those are my two favorite songs of the eighties. I think that's really tough for me. Um, they're both my top three of all time. So it is really tough for me, but I got to go with Prince on that one. Um, and punch myself in the dick for saying it just because respect for respect for Todd there. <laughs> all right. So 86 we had joe with wait joe you had run dmc right yes okay i had him flop sorry so joe had run dmc and aerosmith walk this way uh greg had the smiths there's light on that will never go out i have i fought the law um do we continue with prince purple rain or does one of these songs knock him out here I will, I'm, tell, I'm I will tell you run. for me the dead kennedys do not knock him out so i'll just leave my choice so it's one of year two there uh, I'm I'm rolling with Walk This Way for that. Uh, I think the the Walk This Way taking down Purple Rain. Uh, yeah. Okay. For me, I as much as I love There's Light That Never Goes Out, and I think the Smiths are brilliant. The Smiths aren't too overly influential, uh, and especially if you look at Morrissey has a bigger following as a solo artist in Latin American countries than the Smiths do combined. <laughs> so. Also, Morrissey's an asshole, so yeah, Morrissey. I'll still give him the year, but I'm definitely not going to have him knock out Prince. Like Prince had his problems, everyone does, but he's fucking Prince. Like, yeah. So you're saying roll with Prince over the Smiths? I yeah, I'd say roll with Prince over everyone from that year. I mean, I love run dmc's version of walk this way but i don't think it was even the most influential hip-hop track of that year so yeah. i'd have to i'd have to stick with prince yeah i mean really it wasn't until like the 90s like 89 90 that that became what that monster was um with their play the video and the live performance all that stuff um i gotta go purple rain on that one too not even because i'm biased i just I think it takes it now now is where we come into <laughs> rocky water <laughs> so, i'll just i'll just go like for i think for song of the year i can say something that didn't become relevant for a few more years was the best song of that year but i would have a hard time saying never going to give you up as the song of the 80s only because it's relevant it's a great track and it definitely represents that 80s pop sound but since its cultural relevance was essentially a joke, <laughs> I can't vote it over Prince. It's one of those, I'm happy to give it the honors for song of the year, but I, I can't vote it for song of the decade. Um, I'm actually in 100% agreement there. I will say it's actually <clears throat> tough for me to make the decision to not pick In Excess Never Tear Us Apart because of what that song means to me. But at the same time, I mean... Uh, me and 15 people are in it so <laughs> i gotta go with purple rain over that too 
Did we just reverse Rick Roll you there, Dan? You thought we were going to fight for that, didn't you? I thought I was going to have to surrender Prince to Rick Astley, and I've been mentally prepared for that all day. <laughs> um, I was willing. I was willing to. I was ready for it, and now my headspace has very much changed. So, eighty-eight. We actually had some sentimental songs here. Um, we had Joe with Rod Stewart. My heart can't tell you no. Greg with NKO, NKOTB, don't please don't go girl, and me with Living Color, open letter to a landlord. Um, and I think I mentioned like the first, second episode, like this era is my hardest one. Like it's not hard because of the Prince Purple Rain, but with all the other songs, like it's it's incredibly hard for me. So does Purple Rain make it past any of these tracks? This is, please don't go girl as much as I love the track, as much as I love that album. They're great boy band songs they're great boy band tracks they don't have the lasting power beyond the nostalgia i don't think any song off that album tops prince i mean if we're going to talk just influence significance purple rain is it i mean i can't vote against it even though there's so many tracks I just straight up love in 88. Um, I can't vote against my heart on this one. I really can't. I get this isn't even probably Rod Stewart's best song, but for the 80s, it's probably the one that means the most to me. It's got that sentimental aspect to it. I definitely dig that. I especially get it. I mean, I voted for LL Cool J over Prince. So. Yeah, and I mean, I'll, Living Color here, I love this track, but I can't go against Purple Rain. And to be honest, I in the 90s, there's certain songs where I'm okay surrendering Purple Rain to. Um, there's just so much creativity and game changers in that area, and I think that, I don't think he'll make it past that era, but um, we moved to 89. We got Free Fallen from Joe. Wait, I just want to move back to 88 because had any of us picked Fast Car as the song of the year of 88, I would have had to vote for Fast Car above Prince. And I know it's weird to say since none of us picked Fast Car because we went with Sentimental, but I honestly think if we were to realistically look at it, Fast Car is a top five track of the 80s. And for me, maybe the most important, like like yeah. I mentioned, it got, it got heavy radio play and video play in 1995. Yeah. You know, I think for me, it was, uh, it's got a lot of personal meaning to me, but with that said, it's hard for me to put it on like the best just simply because I'm not willing to debate that with anybody. It's for me, it's just, it's a, it's my song, you know? So like, I'm not going to like debate with anybody. I'm like, you don't like it. That's cool. That's, that's my jam. That's and fair. So that, it's just, it's it's like just there's certain songs on these lists that didn't make it for me because it's like, I'm not going to throw it up there for debate. Like, cause your opinion about it means nothing to me. Like not you personally, just in general, like anybody's opinion doesn't mean anything to me about it because like there's certain songs that are just so personal to me that they, that I keep them there, you know? If that yeah, makes- it's just, it's just interesting the way they fall with us debating the three songs we pick of the year. Cause it could oh, be yeah. a different conversation if we wanted to do like bracket style here. <laughs> I thought about it. It's a, it's a tough way to go about it, but I think for the, the sake of kind of getting down to the biz. Um, getting down the, to the biz marquee. <laughs> as we come to biz marquee, Tom Petty and Dayless Soul here. Um, I am easy, easily able to get rid of Dayless Soul for voting. So we're down to free fall and biz, and biz marquee to lead us out of the 80s or Prince Purple Rain. Uh, this may be partially my age and, and don't get me wrong. I love Prince, but Tom Petty in general, in his discography meant more to me and, and seemed to have a bigger impact during my formative years than Prince did. Uh, so for me, it could have been any of the Tom Petty songs off that album. Uh, so it's, it's Tom Petty for me. They would take the cake there. What about you, Greg? And I knew I should have gone first, so I didn't have to make a decision. Are you saying Biz was the eighties? No, no. <laughs> um, I love Biz Markey, and I love that track. <laughs> but I think it's another one that its cultural significance was bigger in the nineties than it was in eighty nine. Oh yeah. Um, hell, it probably more culturally significant in the early two thousands than it was in ninety nine. Without a doubt. I think it definitely had early streaming. It had a resurgence. But if we're going to narrow down to Purple Rain or Free Falling, 
Um, I want to pause from. I think it's kind of cool. That those are the two we ended up with out of the whole eighties, though. I mean, it's two pretty powerful, impactful tracks. You know, you can't go wrong with either one. It's uh, it's kind of cool that that's where we ended up with when we meet everything out. Yeah, actually, can I jump in and change my vote? Something Gregory mentioned that I think is important to this conversation, and I'll take some of the pressure off him, I guess. You is mentioned the significance in the nineties. Yes. Because uh, again, Tom Petty had significance before this, right? But I think it picks up and it almost snowballs on itself in the night throughout the '90s. Uh, and I think Prince was more influential in the '80s. So if we're talking about a song for the '80s, I'm you've convinced me. I'm switching my opinion. Sweet. My so opinion. since I don't need to pick at all, I'm gonna go throw a curveball and say "Rhythm Nation" by Janet Jackson because <laughs> respect. <laughs> To Miss Jackson, if you're nasty, but no, I I would have gone would have. I'm still gonna go with the Prince track for that exact reason. Like Petty had been around long before this, obviously, but none of us have had a Petty track in our shortlist. I know he takes time between albums, but we didn't have a track in our shortlist for Petty before '89. And now all of a sudden we've got a whole album and that album did it steamrolled through the early portion of the nineties. Whereas purple rain was still steamrolling through the late eighties. You know, um, I mean, Prince is quintessentially eighties, you know? Yeah. He was there in the nineties and stuff like that, but it's that purple rain album was the eighties. Um, and so I'm stuck in the eighties. I mean, I still wear my skinny stonewashed jeans and if I grow hair, it'd be 80 style. And, um, I rock the denim jacket, the Canadian tuxedo. I mean, that's how I roll. So yeah. I uh, I know I was biased towards the song, but I also have it where I do have some like, you know, concessions in the 90s where I'm like, yeah, I can see so many songs kind of taking this track out. So um, I think the assessment of these tracks, though, like by year has been so fun. And I think kind of getting through the 80s now is only six years. I'm interested to see how the 90s go. We have so many different genres that were new and changing and exciting in that era. Um, we have bands that dissolved and bands that came from them. We have rap beefs that transcended <laughs> what seemed like 10 years, but we're done in six months. You know, it's, yeah. there's a well, lot. The 90s, the 90s, I feel like the one hit wonder has always been around, but I feel like that mid 90s to early 2000s was, peak one hit wonders without a doubt and i'm not going to use one of the artists that i'm going to discuss but like if you look at fastball is the way that track is amazing have you listened to the entire album yep i have two one time and that's it it's called isn't it isn't it the fallout isn't that the name of the album it is the fallout yeah fire escape fire escape is such an incredible track i was gonna say i've also listened through it once as well (laughs) their discography is on my computer it's it's insane it's actually really good Um, yeah fire escape is such a great song And that's just quintessential of a lot of these bands from, I think, 95 to maybe 2002, where the one hit isn't the best song on the album. Freaking Wallflowers are a great example. Yeah. So we're going to get into some years. Bringing Down the Horse is such a good album. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into years and I want to just do it now. (laughs) Okay. Let's let's talk about like Harvey Danger and Not A Surf are two of my all time favorite bands. And Joe can attest definitely to the not a surf thing, but like, I love Harvey Danger. I wish they would have ever gotten back together. And if you look at- The flagpole said it wasn't even their best song. No, it wasn't the best song on that album. And they yeah. had two albums after that where that were better than that first album. Well, so, I mean, I, you know how- do we, huge... pick, do we pick the hit because it had the cultural significance of a band we loved? Screw that. Or are we going to go deep? Am I going to pick something off else off where the Merrymakers are for that year? Or- there's not anything off that album, but like we're going to get into that one hit wonder type debate. And well, I mean, you have soul coughing during <laughs> during those years. I have, I have Natalie and Brulia. Everybody knows how much I love Natalie and Brulia. So yeah. it's, um, it's going to be a fun time to be honest. And um, I thought I was going to dive into a ton of hip hop in the air, but I really, there wasn't a lot for me there um, when it came down to choosing things, you know, I'm not fully through the nineties, but um a lot of the grunge and the pop took over for me as opposed to the hip hop, which is interesting. Um, I think if I did this 10 years ago, it'd be all Snoop and everything else, but in Pac, you know, it's just not quite there for me now and looking through all of it and 
Um, so it's going to be fun. I'm really excited for it. I'm glad you just admitted you've gotten soft in your old age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I totally have. I totally have. Um, to the point where my students laugh at my playlist. So uh, this is kind of a side tangent. Do you think there are or there were more one hit wonders during that time? Or do you think we remember more of them? Because one hit wonders also often don't make it out of a decade, let's say. And so a lot of them die shortly after. I mean, like the Archie band was, uh, they were actually the number one uh, track at one point. Like they, the, but the, we don't, we've never heard I've never heard an Archie Band song fully from start to be start to finish. Well, what's no, funny? If you listen to Greg's uh, list that he read, you know, the first couple episodes, many of them were one-hit wonders in the '80s. I think the '80s were chock full of one-hit wonders, at least over in America. You know, overseas maybe a little different, but we had all those synth pop bands and things like that. Yeah, that yeah, song took off here. People were buying the albums, and well, and to Joe's point, even then, like a lot of the the one-hit wonders I listed were movie soundtracks from the late 90s early 2000s yeah so there were songs that did survive beyond that one hit wonder because of a a rebirth from someone who remembered them in their youth because we all know who frankie valley is but how many other frankie valley clones had one hit on the radio back then yeah. that we'll never hear about but i mean meanwhile the 90s didn't... gave us Ainy kamosi and duncan sheik so <laughs> i'm mainly breathing Yes, there's there's a lot of fun to be had with those, and uh, there are some hit one hit wonders who, the second they became big, their labels wanted to go a different direction than they wanted to go, and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of that there. I mean, even Jewel faced that after her stuff. So, um, yeah, intuition's a trash song. That'll be an interesting because of I think from maybe 2003 on, there are always smaller labels. Sub pop has been around for forever. Oh yeah, but I feel like with streaming the rise of the small independent labels if you think about the emo scene emerged from the stable of bands from saddle creek yeah who i don't think any of them fall under that emo category the way a 25 year old would define the emo category because that's pop punk right but without saddle creek we don't branch into that if Rolling Stones not talking about how good Cursive is and Bright Eyes and Rilo Kiley. So the small labels, I think once we move past the 90s when we don't hear about artists because they didn't agree with their label to the rise of in our 20s where the small labels were huge and oh, yeah. still are today because you don't need a big production company anymore. Yeah. Um, even what T-Swift is doing now just re-recording albums <laughs> in her freaking basement, you know, to, to say screw the man. It's kind of cool, but um I'm thoroughly excited about what's to come. And I think a lot of our blending of interests is about to really come together here too in terms of music. And there's so much obscure shit for all of us because we're all in so much different stuff that this is just going to be a hell of a ride. I just say, don't try and monetize until these videos are long and gone, Dan, because it's amazing we haven't bust out into any of these songs yet. I don't think we get through, out, through the 90s without one of us bursting into a track. So I really uh, wanted well, actually, to, but I, I know that YouTube takes them down now, so I really wanted to, but I didn't want to get any videos removed because that happened on my last channel. And so I, I mean, you could always just nice. claim, as long as we do it different enough, it's transformative and it's no longer uh, copyright. It falls under fair use. Well, I when can't I carry it too, so cry, we're safe. So, uh, that's, <laughs> that, that's bound to happen. But gentlemen, this has been a hell of a ride through six years. I'm looking forward to it to the rest of it. maybe by the time we finish we'll be in 2022 and we just won't stop by the time um, we finish zoe will be joining us and she'll hate all our early takes <laughs> except purple rain that's she sings that all the time um let's plan for this canadian one i actually think that's really fun and i'd be interested in doing not just canadian music but just a canadian appreciation uh, of just various things i mean i don't particularly like ketchup chips but they are culturally relevant. <laughs> but, and the best and poutine I've ever had in my life was in Messina, so I'm, I'm in. <laughs> oh, poutine's so good. Uh, I love poutine. I mean, nice. it's interesting because the stuff that does cross over into the States from Canada becomes big. Like Nickelback is so far down the list of Canadian bands. Their first album, which... The State was amazing, that first yeah. album, The State. And mostly just released in Canada. So... Yeah. 
Like, but like you look at Trailer Park Boys and the success it had on Netflix after leaving Canadian television. Yep. Letter Kenny is similar on Hulu. Oh yes. So, folks, Caught in the book of on... pure evil. I mean, that... how long was? Was that Joe? Uh, Todd in the book of pure evil. Oh yeah, it was a short run on Space Network. It was amazing. I mean, how long was Monster Magnet big in Canada before they ever hit? you know, the States, you know, like even like little stuff like that. So, and then when they did hit the States, they were parodying uh, bad boys videos. So yeah, like. yep. it, it's just interesting to watch it all. Um, I used to get the edge where I was, I was like right on the border of getting the edge in back when they had that. Um, so that's where I got all my stuff, you know, like some 41, when I first heard my mother earth, um, tea party, the hip, all that stuff. So it was really cool having that station, even finger 11, when they first came on the scene, you know, long before they were here with their, their hits and stuff. So, um, I'm really looking forward to the 90s, gentlemen. Yeah, me too. This has been a lot of fun. I really, I just love music. So I love coming on and talking about it with you guys. It's been a nice change too. You know, I get into a lot of my comic book conversations and a lot of it's just so, everybody's just so, just set in their opinions and shit. So this is just fun to, to mess around and have some fun. So I appreciate you guys doing this. I'm looking forward to the journey we're on. I love rewatching these. I love hearing people tell me about them. So gentlemen, thank you. Wait, wait, before we get out of here, my shirt, Candy Hearts, not relevant to the 80s at all, <laughs> but it was the, not the first band, but the first big significant like touring band of my friend Merrill from, oddly enough, the new Saddle Creek web board, because that's the kind of nerds I associate with on the internet back then. But Merrill's wonderful, Candy Hearts and Best X on Spotify. I will definitely be wearing a Best X t-shirt at some point on this as well, but yeah. Merrill's awesome. Candy Hearts is a great, fun pop punk band. And then with Best X, her solo project, it's more like a, an industrial pop. But both are wonderful. Merrill's a wonderful person, wonderful artist. So go check it out, folks. I'm all about it. I love that. Joe, any shout outs? Um, yes. So uh, you guys are both on a podcast together. Uh, we are? Cruise Defenders. Whoa, really? Uh, so if anyone wants to go check that out, but more importantly, the uh, logo for it was designed by my beautiful fiance, Amanda. So if anyone's in the, uh, in the market for any sort of graphic design at all, check out amandaerwin.com, check out her stuff and then hit her up. She does great work. Coincidentally, she... I was about to contact her for my YouTube channel to not only have a little sit down with her on about what she does, but to have her beef it up. Well, and like to further that point, Amanda is great. I gave her no design information on that logo. She tells me she had one that Joe vetoed that I haven't seen that I would like to see. But what she did was perfect. It's whimsical, but also very superhero. Uh, mm -hmm. Amanda just, she just nailed it. And she does more than graphic design as well. She freelance writes, she edits. She's been editing my stuff for short story submissions and she knows all kinds of grammar rules that I've never heard of. And she does make me sound so much better when I read it. So Amanda's awesome. Amanda and if she's up for it, if she's up for it, she will have an interview on this channel as well. I should be um, really into that. Excellent. I appreciate you gentlemen. I appreciate you also, Amanda. That is an amazing logo. And to everyone listening, we got through the eighties, we survived. We may not survive 2022, who the fuck knows. We made <laughs> and here we are starting the 90s next Tuesday. So stay with us. It's a journey and you'll love every moment of it. Much love, guys. And this is just going to be a hell of a run. Remember to comment, folks, so we can troll you. Yes. Comment, get trolled, troll us. Much love. I make that joke, but I do check the comments a couple times a week in between these recordings. I'm waiting. <laughs> I am waiting, folks. Love it. All right, everyone. We are signing off from the 80s and about to travel into the 90s and flannels and ripped jeans and baggy legs. <laughs>